Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for letting me speak in English. Um, so it's been, it's, we've had a fantastic, I'm very grateful to the previous speaker for a superb introduction to, to some of what I need you to know about DNA. Um, so far we've heard about use, uh, how the, the DNA in living organisms is responsible for, for some memory. Uh, and, and what I'm going to talk about is, is what you might call not living DNA, uh, being useful for memory. Uh, and also, it's an interesting distinction that maybe in the past, when people thought of memory, we just thought of what was in our heads. And in the last few years, we've all become very familiar with using the word memory to describe a, a thing that's in our computer uh, that holds information um, and, and, and saves us from using our own memory very frequently. And, and if you're approximately my age, you're just at that generation that's going through uh, this change where you used to have to learn lots of phone numbers. And now I don't know any phone numbers, including my own phone number, because it's in the memory of my phone. Uh, and, and computing memory and this form of memory that we, we try to use to store things for us, not in our, in our minds. Um, we, we know we've needed to do this for a long time. Books uh, have existed for a long time, and before that there were other ways of recording information. More recently, um, we've used some different forms, and you see these in the pictures uh, in, in my slides. Here's some examples. Um, again, it depends on your age whether you know what I'm talking about with some of these. Uh, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old, and I've used all the technologies that you see there, and I can no longer use any of those technologies, not because I can't remember, I'm not that old, um, but because they don't exist anymore, they've gone away. Uh, and if I had a Betamax tape or a floppy disk in my hand, it, it, it's probably broken, it's probably decayed, even though it's just 10 or maybe 20 or 30 at most years old. Uh, and even if it hadn't decayed, the machine that I would put it in that would talk to my phone or my computer or my email system, that, that's gone and is broken too. So any information I didn't remember to copy onto the next device or any information where I lost the next device it is gone and is lost. Uh, of course, a lot of things that doesn't matter very much. The pictures I just put on Facebook don't matter very much. My tweets this morning don't matter very much. But some things are really important. Nowadays, I and, and all of us are using things that look more or less like some of those, I guess. They're just some examples. And that those are all current. Those all work. How many of those will still work in 10 years' time or in 20 years' time? I'm confident to suggest that none of those will be around in 20 years' time. So what are we going to do? What are we doing with this vast amount of information that we're producing? How are we going to keep it safe, the bits of it that we want to keep safe? And this is a question that gets a little philosophical, but is also very real and practical. Where I work at the European Bioinformatics Institute, we are one of the world's main centres where scientists deposit genomics information that they've deciphered in their laboratories, and they send it to us on the internet, and we curate it, and we compare different data sources, and we put that all in huge databases, and we serve that back to the scientific community uh, over the internet. And you don't need to worry about the details of the graph. It's really there to remind me that we have a very easily understood problem, which is the, the, the squiggly line, which is how fast the data is growing that we are being asked to look after and serve to people. That, that's, the, that's the rate at which it's growing. And the straight red line is the rate at which we can afford to buy hard disk drives. And, and by any measure, that they, they've separated. And we can't afford to keep up. And this. We, it's not the end of the world, though do keep funding us if anyone asks you whether bioinformatics is a good thing. Um, but um, we, we, we're coping with it okay. We have a number of meetings to do that. This is what a bunch of scientists having a meeting over beer looks like. And it was exactly in that bar, and I'm the one on the left in the blue top, um, where a colleague and I one day after a day-long meeting about how our databases would keep up, had the idea, we sat there over our beers and said, isn't there some other way? These hard disk drives are really expensive and the electricity to run them is really expensive and we have to buy new ones every few years and that's really expensive. There's, is there something else we can do? And ironically, we looked at each other and we said, well, DNA is itself a really good way 
of storing information. It's a digital medium. You, you have a string of DNA molecules. Each little molecule in that string takes one of four forms. There's four different forms, and we've already seen that the A, C, G, T nomenclature used. That's the first letter of the molecules. And DNA is a, a, a long string of those molecules, and depending on what order they come in, there's, there's a message in there. And of course, that's in the genome of every cell of every living organism. Uh, and what genomic scientists are really trying to do is to understand the code which is used in the genome. Some parts of it we're very good at understanding now, and some parts we're very poor at understanding. Uh, and that's what we're still working on. So this is how long DNA has been around being used as a source of information, and we've heard a bit about that, so I can spend less time on this. Another part of my, my day job is to study evolutionary trees and the process of evolution of genomes. It's been going on on Earth for something in the region of three and a half billion years, 3,500 million years, um, and there's some DNA which is showing you that's the common theme, that's the thread that unites all these organisms. What I actually do in my day job is look at the DNA sequences and compare them in different organisms to try and learn about evolution because it's very difficult to do an evolution experiment. Um, and so we had this realisation that, that DNA is a medium that we might be able to control and use for memory, memory in the kind that's in our computers or in our phones, memory of the kind where we want to look after digital information maybe for a very long time. This is, this is what a, a current DNA reading machine looks like. Um, there's, there's thousands of these around the world. Now they're, they're, they're quite expensive, maybe a couple of hundred thousand euros. Um, you can probably get a discount if you buy a lot of them. Uh, and uh, they're about that big. You can see my colleague Paul Batoni in the background um, to give an idea of scale of the machine. Um, and any, any month now, I know people working for the company who are producing a device like the one in that picture. It's not for sale yet. They've been promising it for the last two years. They're still promising, but we genuinely think it's on the way. That's going to become... And that little machine in the hand will be more powerful uh, by ten times than the machine in the background. So this is a technology driven by genomics that's going very fast. So compared to a few years ago, it's pretty easy to read DNA sequences, to get back from a physical DNA molecule the sequence of letters A, C, G, and T. Writing DNA is harder. So our cells are really good at copying DNA. Copying is easy, and humans have managed to uh, learn how that's done in a cell and make laboratory procedures which are very, very efficient and can copy it. Uh, but you need, a, you need at least one template to start from, uh, and if you want to make your own template as a starting point, that's more difficult. These photographs are from a company called Agilent in California, who we've worked with. They have a sort of clean room facility. The, the one on the right is, is uh, zooming in on the machine that makes DNA. It, it's actually rather like a, an inkjet printer, in fact, but instead of firing different colored dyes to a piece of paper, you, you fire a solution with DNA molecules in and that grows fragments of DNA on a glass slide. Um, and they can make DNA fragments, not very long ones, uh, but they can do it with pretty high accuracy now. We knew about these technologies which exist because of genomics and, and medical research, uh, and we realized that we could um, put together an experiment and do this um, with other information. So here's DNA. We've seen that it's, it's a very small molecule. Um, you can get an idea. It's, in, it's, in, it's measured in nanometers, typically. It forms this double helix, which is very famous, but isn't uh, important for the work we've done, particularly. It's these single strands that have the information encoded in them in the sequence of molecules, which you can think of a sequence of letters, uh, or I like to think of it now uh, as a sequence of Lego bricks in four different colors. And it's harder. Um, than clipping Lego bricks together, but just as you can make a tower of Lego bricks in four different colors, and you could choose what order to put the colors in, and we could invent a code to send one another messages, that's exactly what we felt we could do using DNA molecules themselves. So we imagined an experiment we might do, where starting at the top left in this picture, we would have information on our computer. We would send that information uh, via the internet to Agilent in California, and they would make physical DNA to our design using the code we would come up with that would somehow store the information in it. 
Uh, they sent that back to us. They actually sent it by FedEx. Uh, it doesn't, it's not difficult to move DNA around the world. I brought some here with me uh, for this, for this, um, this afternoon. Um, uh, uh, it's very easy to keep as long as you keep it cool and dry uh, and maybe in the dark. Um, it's very secure. As, as you all know, you're all carrying around uh, a few hundred grams of DNA. You subject it to all sorts of abuse, um, yet it basically comes out the other end intact. You know, we, we all survive a, hell, a good long life, I hope, and we pass it to our descendants and so on. Um, we did a bit of laboratory work uh, outside Cambridge where I work. We actually sent uh, the DNA sample on to a sequencing machine in Germany. Um, we got the results, we will decode it. This was our plan, and then we had to talk to all the people involved in the chain and work out a code that would achieve this. Um, but before we do that, I step back a little bit, and I have to admit we weren't the first people in the world to have this idea. Uh, I don't expect you to read this again, it's, it's a reminder for me, but back in 1995, uh, a paper was published in a scientific journal that suggested that DNA was a good medium for storing information. Uh, so it, it's been thought of a long time ago. Uh, this, this, this person, Eric Brown, didn't do any experiments. He just proposed the idea uh, and explored you know, how big uh, a brain would have to be. His idea was to uh, replicate a brain. We've been less ambitious. We're just trying to replicate a bit of memory. Um, I want to thank the organisers for giving me, at this point, for giving me the opportunity to come to Ars Electronica and, and speak to you. Uh, an absolute inspiration to me, uh, which I knew about when we started investigating this, was the work of Ed Eduardo Katz. In 1999, he presented a project here at Ars Electronica where he encoded a message into the genome, in this case, the DNA of a living organism. I was able to go over to the Ars Electronica building yesterday and they've got the books out uh, for sale, and you can buy for four euros the 1999 catalogue. I, I now have mine, so the whole trip was worth it, if only for that. Uh, and, uh, and on page 310 uh, to 313, in English and then German, is, is Eduardo Katz's description of his project. So I have a copy of that for the first time. Uh, and this is what the installation looked like. Uh, the message he encoded was a biblical quotation. It read, let man have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Um, and that was placed in, in bacteria, at which you could, you could view in the room. And on the left-hand side is some DNA representation of that message. On the right-hand side, projected on the wall, is the original quotation. What I've supplied over the top is what happened when they, at the end of the exhibition, took the bacteria, uh, extracted the genome, uh, read it back to see what the message should have been, uh, and highlighted in red are, are, are three errors. Um, that came. And this is why if you want to use DNA uh, as the memory of important information that you don't want lost or corrupted over time, don't put it in a living organism because it will evolve and it will, it will mutate and it will evolve and it will slowly degrade your information or change your information. For living organisms, we've heard that's really important and the analogy was this is why we are not bacteria, which is absolutely correct. But for storing information safely, you don't want to use a living organism, but you can use DNA. It has lots of fantastic properties. About this time last year, uh, I met a British artist called Charlotte Jarvis, who was also very interested in storing information in, in DNA. Uh, normally, I spend a few minutes talking about her work, but since late last year, we've been collaborating on, on a project. Um, and for the first time here today, Charlotte and I are presenting work jointly um, or, or together, one after, sequentially, I should say, really. Uh, so I won't say anything more, but she's just there and she'll be talking to you later on. Uh, other people have done large projects use, uh, writing into DNA. Craig Venter uh, may be known to some of you. He's done uh, a lot of very innovative work in genomics, including the creation of a synthetic bacterium where they, they took the known sequence of the genome of a bacterium, created that DNA at vast expense, so tens of millions of dollars, taking many years to do, and put that genome into a, a, an empty cell, in a sense, and, and created a living copy of a bacterium. They didn't only use the genome of the original bacterium, 
but they added extra information, including the names of the authors of the scientific work uh, and a couple of quotations. Um, and George Church, who I know is very well known to Ars Electronica, uh, and there's information about some of his work in the building uh, across the river there, um, also did a project storing, in his case, a book. He, he in, recorded information, as did essentially everyone up to this point. Um, what was stored was, was sentences or uh, quantities of English language text. Um, his, his work was, was a book that he and a co-author had written that was encoded. Uh, when they came to read it back, they, they had a few errors, which I will talk a little bit about in a minute. So back, back to our experiment, we didn't know about George Church's work, we knew about the other things that were going on, uh, but we wanted to illust illustrate that you could store anything, just as your phone or your computer can store images and documents and movies and sound and anything you can put on a computer, which is many, many things today. Um, if we can store them on a computer, we felt we should be able to store them in DNA. So we invented a code that would do that. We looked at the properties of DNA and how we would be able to manipulate it. And we imagined starting with the top of the picture illustrates in, in a little schematic form any file on your computer. This is actually part of a, a Shakespeare's sonnet. You can see thou art more lovely and more temperate. Uh, on a computer, I think everyone's familiar, that's represented as zeros and ones. And as long as you know the code to translate between zeros and ones and, and the English language in a text document, you can recover the information. And there's a different code for the sound in an MP3 file. And there's another code for a PDF document. And there's another code for a Word document or a movie and so on. We invented our own code that would take any computer file uh, and through some steps that I won't for lack of time, explain to you in more detail this afternoon, we could put that into a form where we would design DNA that would store that message. One of the important features I will just mention is that although humans can write novel strands of DNA, now we can't make very large ones, not nearly the size of the genomes that have been described to us, and about 200 base pairs, 200 molecules at a time is the limit to what can be written. So we had to invent a code that could take the store the message in a lot of small pieces and put them back together again. So we had to invent an indexing system that would do this. And we were also very concerned to think there has to be some kind of error tolerance or even error correction, just as our computers, our hard drives on your computer, you may not, maybe don't know it, but they're always checking for errors. And if an error occurs, they correct it. There's error correcting code going on. I think everyone is aware that their mobile phone uses an error correcting code. It doesn't always get it quite right. Sometimes the sound is a bit garbled, but they work pretty well. And we devised a code that would have some error correction properties. So even if a bit of the message was damaged, we could reconstruct it correctly. Here we are viewing it as Lego blocks again, if that helps in your mind to think what we're doing. We're making lots of Lego blocks of DNA. We're going to read them back, and we're going to reconstruct a message. This is part of the file that actually defines the code that we use to go from computerized information in the, what we might call traditional sense uh, into a code of DNA. Um, also, because we're that kind of scientist, we use that as one of the files that we stored in our experiment. And we wanted to choose other bits of information that were arguably had meaning to us and were of high value, the kind of thing you might want to store for a long time, to keep safe, not just for the lifetime of your computer, but maybe for, for humans to have access to for a long time. So one of the things we chose was a file containing Watson and Crick's publication uh, from 1953 describing the structure of DNA for the first time, for which they won a Nobel Prize. Uh, another thing we wanted to uh, illustrate was, was the use of sound, um, and, and we ended up choosing a, a, an excerpt from Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream, which coincidentally was 50 years ago, just a few days. I have a dream that one day yes. this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yes. I like to play it because it breaks up the talk and helps us all concentrate. Uh, obviously, the message is a very strong one. Um, uh, but also, of course, it illustrates we're not proposing to record or only be able to save a transcript 
of Martin Luther King's words, but we can store his actual voice, and I'm sure that's something we would want to have around for a long time. Uh, and another uh, example we chose as, a, as, as another a piece of text of great value was Shakespeare's sonnets in a very simple text format, as had been done in previous experiments, all 154 Shakespeare sonnets in one file. And lastly, because we're horrendous self-publicists, we um, included a photograph of our own research institute. Uh, you can't see my, my office is on the other side. Yeah. It's also important to point out that it's always beautifully sunny in Cambridge. <laughs> and so we made designs for DNA using our code, for in, in encoding all of those files. And, um, and we sent that information to our collaborators in California, and we asked them to make for us the DNA. And the box there you can see, and I'm not going to hold one because you, you can see a picture of me holding it, but Charlotte has the box, and why don't you just take it up. DNA is not scary. Um, so there, there's, there's, are there four in there? Yeah. yeah. If you let them go around the room, what you can do is you'll do what I did, those of you that get a chance to have a look at it, is it will arrive to you. In my case, I took it out of the box and I looked at it and I said, oh no, it's gone wrong, they haven't sent me anything. This test tube is clearly empty. Um, and that's probably what most of you, unless you have lab experience yourselves, that's what each of you will probably do that gets the opportunity. And the trick they teach you, and I lab colleagues very quickly told me, you hold it up, there's probably not enough light in here, but try and get the light shining through the tube and you look up into the base, and at the base of that, there's a tiny speck of dust, or almost you might say it was dirt. And for those of you that don't get an opportunity, uh, I'll be around at the end, so come and have a look if you want. Um, but it, it, it's also, it looks like um, if you had a small drop of salty water in a glass, and then you let that dry out, so the water evaporated away, and you were left with a tiny film, in that case of salt, uh, on the glass. That's what DNA, dry DNA in a test tube looks like. And our files, it was a total of 750 kilobytes of information, and that's an almost imperceptible amount of dust of DNA. Um, that's, on, that's described there. To give you maybe a more useful um, analogy, if we filled one of these little tubes to the top with DNA, that would have the same storage capacity as one million CD-ROMs. And if you can't do a million CD-ROMs, I don't really have enough space here, but a million cd you know when you buy them, they, they come in a little pack about this tall, all right? It would be 10,000 of those packs, and that would be enough to put a layer 10 meters by 10 meters. So we could sort of fill the floor here about this deep in CDs and wade through it and worry about whether that information was kept securely, or we could put it in one little test tube that's the size of your little finger. So that's how dense the information storage in DNA can be. So we did this, we got the samples back, I was eventually persuaded that there was DNA there and it was worth taking it to the laboratory and we gave it to our colleagues that know how the sequencing machines work and they did the work, they gave us the results back, they said this is what your fragments of DNA appear to be looked like and we went through a decoding procedure uh, using computer programs I wrote, exactly the reverse of the encoding procedure uh, uh, and it worked well. Uh, it's always a bit of an anticlimax at this point in the talk to say it worked well because I can show you a picture that was the original and then I can show you a picture that looks like it and then I can say it worked. So the point I want to make, that you, I want you to understand that one journalist I spoke to on the phone I could not explain this to properly is that it's not just that the pictures looked the same the files were the same. The journalist actually insisted that I email her the file that was the decoded version because she had the original and she wanted to check they were the same. And I said, they're the same because they are the same. It's, if I email you one, it's no more the same as the one I've just sent you because I've just moved some electrons from Cambridge to Zurich and, and she wouldn't believe it. And so I emailed her a file and she phoned me back the next day and said, thank you very much. And yes, they are the same. <laughs> and of course, all the files we did were the same. And we were able to reconstruct with 100% with accuracy 
that, that the files were entirely unchanged. Although in the process of making DNA and reading it back, there are occasional errors, because we had built a code that could correct errors, just as your computers do, just as your mobile phones do, we could reproduce the original files 100% correctly. And in just a few more minutes, I won't talk much more about this. Um, because we were so keen to think whether this could work uh, as a real technology in the future, we did, we did a bit more analysis. One thing we did was look at how would this work on a larger scale. We did approximately one megabyte of information. Uh, but, but how much information can you do? Uh, in the world at the moment, in total, there's three zettabytes of information, it's estimated. I don't even know what a zettabyte is. It's an unthinkably large amount of information. Our method could work with that much information. Uh, we wouldn't have to change the system. It, it appears that it would all be okay. It would be very, very expensive, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But at least in principle, if you had the money and the time, you could do it. And if, and for scientists, graph is, isn't compelling, uh, I, I've mocked up this picture to illustrate that you could put all the information in the whole world in about 1.5 cubic meters, which you could easily fit in a small van. So that would be, and that's not, just, that, that's not just one copy of everything in the world, that's if you took every data center in the world, every person's computer in the world, and so on, you could fit it in one van. DNA lasts a really long time. Saying it lasts for three and a half billion years is not quite fair of me, because of course many copies are made and passed from parent to child in that time. But although I haven't done the experiment, the experiment has been done to see if DNA, to see if DNA is stable for a long time. We have genome sequences from samples from mammoths, 20,000 years old, from bison, 60,000 years old, Neanderthals, 40,000 years old. Uh, there's pollen and bacteria, maybe approximately half a million years old. And very recently, you may have heard, there was press coverage of a project where ancient horse genomes were studied. That's 700,000 years that that DNA has lasted. Those weren't carefully controlled experiments. Those were animals or Neanderthals that died and lay down somewhere cold, got frozen, got rediscovered by contemporary humans. So DNA will last an immensely long time. We did some modeling of whether this was, was useful uh, and on what time scale. This tells me that at current costs, you need to be prepared to spend as much money now uh, as it would take to store in a data center for 1,000 to 6,000 years to make it cost effective. If the price comes down by a factor of 10, and because of genetics research, that's going to happen in a year or so, then the time scale where it's cost effective comes down to 100 to 500 years. In another couple of years, when it's a factor of 10 cheaper again, we're looking at 10 to 50 year time scales. Maybe you or I would be prepared to store information for our children or our grandchildren. We want to put it somewhere safe. We want to know it will last. We can just forget about it. One way of storing it would be somewhere cold and dark and dry. This is pictures of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. There is already a facility in Norway which is perfect for storing DNA. It requires very little maintenance. If the electricity fails, it equilibrates to the local temperature, which is slightly below zero. If you want to do it in your own home, that's just fine too. Just stick it in the fridge. It's quite safe. With that, I'm finished. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm going to let Charlotte tell you a bit about what she does.